think I'm going to go ahead and get us started here. This is Wendy Caldwell, the Executive Director of Monarch Joint Venture, and thanks for joining us. Um, we're really excited to partner with the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group today to bring you an update on the Monarch CCAA for Energy and Transportation Lands, um, which is just an amazing accomplishment and tool for getting more Monarch habitat on the ground. Um, so before turning it over to Iris, um, I just wanted to note how we we wanted to provide this opportunity for our Monarch Conservation Partners to learn about um, the updates to the CCAA and the finalization of it so you can become more familiar with it and how to engage with and promote it. Um, just quick logistical things. If you have questions, you can put them into the chat box. I've learned with GoToWebinar, there's a feature um, if you for a if you go to the send chat to drop down menu, there's one called send question to staff. So feel free to put your questions in there, and and we will um, come back to a Q and A session at the end for our presenters. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Iris to take it away. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Wendy, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited to have this opportunity uh, to share with you all about the Monarch Conservation Agreement. Um, I'm joined today by Dan Salas and Tim Mail, um, who were two of our key partners and leaders in helping to put this agreement together um, in collaboration with more than 40 uh, utility companies and departments of transportation. Um, so we're excited to have the opportunity to give you an update on what this CCAA means. So um, for today, we have just over an hour for our webinar. Um, so we're gonna be skimming through a lot of information at kind of a high level. Um, but we'll start with just a very brief introduction about what the Monarch CCAA is. Um, then I'll turn it to Tim to talk about species conservation from kind of a broader policy perspective, which helps, again, to put this CCAA in some context. Um, then I'll briefly talk a little bit more about the partnership and the effort that brought this CCAA together. Um, Dan will then talk through some of the key elements of the CCAA and, and how it works um, so you better understand um, those aspects. And then lastly, we'll end with a couple of suggestions on how all of you as important conservation partners can help utilities and DOTs um, who are um, hoping to enroll into the CCAA. And then, as Wendy said, we'll leave some time for questions um, at the end. So um, to start with, what is a CCAA? Um, CCAA stands for Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances. Um, it's one of a number of uh, voluntary pre-listing tools um, that the Fish and Wildlife Service has um, that essentially incentivize voluntary, proactive, um, and often immediate conservation for at-risk species. Um, in this case, it's a tool for species that are not yet listed um, and is intended for uh, non-federal partners. So at the simplest of levels, it's an, a voluntary agreement between non-federal uh, landowners and land managers and the Fish and Wildlife Service. This particular agreement, the Monarch CCAA, is the first nationwide CCAA. So right out of the gate, um, it's a really notable achievement that we've been able to develop an agreement of this scale, um, working very closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service and, again, a number of partners, including more than 40 utility companies and transportation agencies. The agreement uh, was approved by the Fish and Wildlife Service earlier this month on April 3rd. And in doing so, this agreement um, promotes the management of monarch habitat on a variety of energy and transportation lands, which we'll, we'll talk through in more detail. It also provides an opportunity for utility companies and departments of transportation and railroads to make and demonstrate the conservation commitments that they um, are integrating into their system and their, their management of lands. And then at the same time, it provides some very important regulatory certainty in the event that the monarch were to become a listed species, or even if it doesn't, it provides that important regulatory certainty that they know and can expect 
what they need to do um, to meet those conservation um, benefits, um, and then have some operational flexibility in terms of when and how they are integrating those conservation activities into their everyday operations. So that um, certainty and flexibility, uh, particularly for um, industry, is, is really key um, and allows us to really utilize this vast network of energy and transportation lands that we have across the U.S. Um, for this conservation benefit. Why is this so important? Um, as we all know, monarchs are in need. Um, there's great opportunities um, and need to create habitat um, across a variety of different landscapes all across the U.S. Um, this agreement was developed in line with many of the principles of the all hands on deck um, approach and paper and studies that have been um, put out there to help respond to population declines. We fully recognize that energy companies and transportation agencies are already managing millions of acres of land and oftentimes are already maintaining vast areas of habitat. Um, and so recognizing that, recognizing um, potential uncertainty around an upcoming listing decision, um, this was an important agreement to put in place to help incentivize those companies to continue to do that work and find ways to expand that work. As we all know, you know, monarchs unfortunately are not alone in terms of the declines that they're seeing and, and habitat loss for other pollinators as well. And so we really hope that this agreement serves as an important model for large scale landscape level conservation, um, collaboration with industry, um, public private partnership, um, and really again is an innovative approach um, that we hope can be used for other species um, as well as in other industries. The goal of the CCAA, again, is to encourage this voluntary conservation on energy and transportation lands that benefits monarch butterflies. The agreement is a 25-year agreement, and over the course of that um, agreement, we hope to enroll up to 26 million acres of energy and transportation lands across the U.S., which we estimate would contribute more than 300 million stems of milkweed, and within that system would provide more than 2 million acres of monarch foraging habitat um, over the coming decades. So to, again, kind of take a step back, um, that's just a brief introduction on what the CCAA is about, and we'll pick it back up here in a bit, um, but want to turn it to Tim um, to provide just a little bit more background um, on and context for species conservation um, at, again, kind of a policy level. So Tim, I'll turn it to you. Thanks, Iris. Thanks, Iris. I really appreciate that. And um, as Iris said, I'm going to broaden things out a little bit because I think one of the things that often surprises people about endangered species is that simply identifying them as endangered or threatened or declining isn't enough. Um, and that's because so many species depend not just on us leaving them alone, but on us doing a, a set of active uh, management um, actions of habitat restoration and other things. So. You think about the two, gener two categories of, of conservation as being protection uh, from basically direct human intervention and then active management. Um, the monarch has a bit of both, but it really falls into that active management and restoration uh, category. Um, Iris, if you could go to the next slide. So this is a breakdown for all the listed species under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and if you look at them and you categorize the species that need had habitat management as conservation reliant, as many scientists have done, or those that just need to be basically left alone, this is what the chart of all those endangered species looks like. So more than 80% are conservation reliant. That means there are things like habitat loss, habitat degradation, succession of their habitat um, that may be affecting them and causing their decline. Um, versus species where, let's say, it's over harvest or over hunting uh, or transient disturbance or, you know, direct pollution that might be causing, uh, causing harm. Um, so for that category of conservation-reliant species, the Endangered Species Act has very few direct tools. The, the regulatory prohibitions of the Endangered Species Act do very little to require someone to proactively go out and restore habitat or maintain habitat. Most of the tools, most of the regulatory 
powers really of the Endangered Species Act are focused on things like limiting over harvest or limiting pollution or limiting direct habitat destruction. Um, so it's really important, agreements like this are really important to be able to get that kind of active management going on the ground. I know many of you know this, but it's just trying to put the monarch in context. Um, and this is a, a really difficult problem. Next slide, Iris. Because this graph shows the growth in species that we have under the Endangered Species Act. Um, so there's more and more species to manage all the time, more and more conservation reliant species uh, to manage um, all the time. And that act of listing them, of getting them protected under the Endangered Species Act because they, they've declined to a certain point, um, it doesn't trigger the kinds of, um, doesn't always trigger the kinds of uh, interventions and actions that the species needs. Um, so just to give a perspective on how these species are doing, next slide. This is a graph that shows the status of species under the, under the Endangered Species Act today. So even though they've been, quote, protected, a majority of those species are still declining. Um, a fraction are stable, and then a much smaller fraction are improving. There's actually a plant that was identified as recovered today in Tennessee. So I like to celebrate good news like that. But the majority of species continue declining, and a big reason for that is because they are dependent on active management. Next slide. Um, now, this shows what happens with funding under the Endangered Species Act and why partners funding, like the funding and the activity that will happen under this agreement is so critical. The way money is distributed today, federal money is distributed today, 80% of the funding that uh, exists under the Endangered Species Act goes to just 5% of listed species. Um, and for another 80% of species, uh, they get just 5% of funding. So this is, this is a, a chart that shows federal uh, and state funding for listed species. And then next slide. And as you might be able to guess uh, from this graph, the little gray bar is invertebrates, invertebrates like the monarch butterfly. Vast majority of the funding goes to vertebrate species, goes to fish, as this graph shows, or birds or mammals. Um, and so if you, if all you do is list the monarch uh, as endangered, if the Fish and Wildlife Service were to decide to do that, threatened, um, for a species that is dependent on habitat management, on active management, as the monarch is, it's unlikely to get a lot of federal funding. The simple prohibitions of the law are unlikely to be effective to the extent needed to get the species to recover. Um, and because it's an invertebrate, for lots of other reasons, it's likely to get very little, uh, very little direct federal funding. Um, so I'll stop there and turn it back to Iris, but these are, and Dan, these are a set of reasons why, um, why this kind of agreement is so crucial for uh, habitat uh, or a management dependent species like the monarch butterfly. Great, thank you, Tim. So I think, you know, certainly as, as we've been having these conversations across the, the energy and transportation sectors, I think that um, what was certainly clear is that um, having an agreement like the CCAA in place was going to be important um, to motivate and provide confidence to energy and transportation companies that by doing voluntary work um, or early, immediate, proactive work, um, that they could do that without kind of fear of uh, potential regulation um, or penalty um, in the in the future. So I want to talk a little bit more about again how the agreement um, came to be, and really this this conversation started um, about five years ago through a working group that we facilitate at the University of Illinois Chicago um, that we call the Rights of Voyage Habitat Working Group. And this working group brings together uh, energy companies, transportation agencies, railroads, a variety of state, federal, um, local agencies, and, and also conservation nonprofits and other partners to have a really collaborative conversation around how can we be managing and promoting uh, pollinator habitat and a variety of other um, wildlife habitat and just generally you know, healthier ecosystems along um, energy and transportation rights of way, as well as on other related energy and transportation lands. And thinking about that, again, from a cost perspective, you know, what's most cost effective, um, what's 
um, most uh, appropriate and realistic in terms of implementation and management going forward um, so we can ensure that, again, these projects are successful. So the working group, um, again, has recognized that um, you know, vegetation management um, on the millions upon millions of acres of again, roadsides, utility corridors, rail corridors that crisscross um, the U.S. has been um, you know, something that, that we've been managing and, and dealing with um, since the initial construction of, of this type of infra infrastructure you know, hundreds of years ago. Um, and that we've certainly, over the history um, of managing that infrastructure and managing that vegetation, seen trends. Um, and increasingly, the types of management tools and techniques that are being used um, are being classified um, under what we call integrated vegetation management, which is really selecting the right tool for the right job um, and really trying to minimize um, unnecessary impact or effects. Um, where possible. And ideally, the type of vegetation that you're maintaining on a roadside or on a utility corridor um, is, is low growing, um, really fits into this early successional kind of habitat um, classification, which just so happens to be really great pollinator habitat, um, as well as supporting a variety of other species. But as, again, we've kind of alluded to, again, this concern around uh, potential endangered species or at-risk species that could be regulated, um, there is a, a very real um, understanding across the industries that habitat for um, endangered or threatened species tends to complicate operations, um, can add project delays, adds costs, and so an important um, conversation and an important need for us to really incentivize and promote this work across these types of lands is to find a balanced way to both do conservation work um, to support monarchs and other species, but then maintain some level of flexibility. So if that um, utility company needs to do work in a particular area, they have the flexibility to do that. Um, or the same with you know, a minor road construction project or some other um, just maintenance or modernization type work, um, they don't end up needing to go through you know, months or years potentially um, of permitting um, in order to be able to do that. So the agreement itself, again, has been um, trying to strike that balance between again, meeting a very um, important conservation need that we have for the monarch and then also providing that flexibility. The CCAA um, has brought together, as I mentioned, um, more than 40 utility companies and departments of transportation all across the United States. Um, so this diverse uh, partnership, again, I think is um, an indicator of, again, the level of interest, um, as well as the broad geographic um, involvement and participation of partners that are, are interested in doing this type of work. So we literally have organizations um, you know, from Arizona and California all the way up through um, Maine. Um, and all of these organizations were crucial partners in the development of the agreement, along with the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, in terms of developing, again, an agreement that was going to be able to maximize that conservation benefit, um, as well as, again, provide that operational flexibility. To give you a sense of the, the, time, um, the timeline for the development of the agreement and just kind of a quick history, as I said, um, the Rights Away Habitat Working Group has really been um, kind of the, the forum where these conversations began. Um, so following actually one of our um, working group meetings back in the fall of 2017, um, we formed what we called the CCAA Advisory Team. Um, I think we started off with about um, a dozen, maybe two dozen utility companies and DOTs that were interested and committed to developing um, a CCAA. And miraculously, and to huge credit um, to Dan, who you're going to hear from um, in just a little bit, um, we were able to draft that agreement um, in just about a year. And so we, we drafted that agreement again with um, a lot of involvement and technical expertise um, from our industry partners as well as the Fish and Wildlife Service. So we work very closely with them. 
We submitted that draft um, in de December of 2018. Um, the CCAA, as some of you probably recall, um, went out for a public comment period um, in the spring of 2019, a 60-day public comment period. And then we've been working closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and other stakeholders um, since that time to make sure that all the public comments and concerns were addressed. Um, and the final review and approval, again, was just completed in March of this year. The agreement was finalized on April 3rd. And we have now um, opened what we call our early enrollment um, for the CCAA um, and have a number, a couple dozen utilities and DOTs um, that are actively working on their applications to get enrolled um, in the CCAA today. I want to also acknowledge, again, the importance of uh, partnerships throughout the development of the CCAA. Um, all these organizations and others, um, not to leave anyone out, but these are some of the key conservation groups that we've been working very closely with um, in the Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group. Um, their expert review and input um, throughout the development of the CCAA, um, as well as um, through other projects and activities that we do through the Rights Way Working Group um, has been invaluable. Um, we've tried very hard to align the monitoring requirements um, in the CCAA with, again, the monitoring venture methodology for the rapid assessment um, tools for roadsides. Uh, monitoring venture and others were also involved in helping us develop a um, across industry pollinator scorecard for both transportation and utility lands. And that pollinator scorecard is available um, on our website as well. Um, and then again, all these organizations um, really are supporting a lot of good on the ground work um, on energy and transportation lands as well. So at this point, I'm gonna turn things um, over to Dan um, so he can walk through, again, some of the important aspects and benefits of this of the CCAA. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Iris. Yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about how the CCA itself works, just to get an idea of how this works on the ground. Um, but also, I wanna start here with a little more detail on some of the expected benefits we hope to see out of an agreement like this. So at its core, you know, at a fundamental level, what all the practices, what the agreement overall is trying to do is really trying to get more milkweed and nectar plants on the ground. Um, you know, fundamentally, that's the thing that we can control on these energy and transportation lands and um, try to affect through the agreement. Of course, you know, step up from that then, you know, what are we trying to do because of that is, uh, is create more monarchs, right? And so creating more habitat, uh, sustaining habitat where it already exists, um, trying to do those things to, to do that industry and that sector's part to help support monarchs and uh, implement conservation is, is sort of the end goal of all that on the ground conservation. But then, as we've kind of alluded to already in, in what Tim and Iris were both speaking to, is that there's some of these bigger picture sort of benefits that we um, have already seen in some measure from, from the partnership and the involvement that we've seen. Uh, but also, you know, hope that the CCAA can provide um, still to come. So some of that is encouraging that collaborative conservation uh, amongst industries, um, and then also using the CCAA as a model for, for future conservation. I'll just go to the next slide. Great. So yeah, in terms of on-the-ground benefits, um, again, the, the goal is ultimately to sustain and or increase milkweed nectar plants where they occur on these rights of ways. So trying to promote those practices that, that help to avoid impacts, but also then promote habitat where possible. Um, there's also, in addition to just the, the general sort of foraging and breeding habitat for monarchs, there's also additional uh, protection commitments for lands that are near uh, documented overwintering grounds. So especially for like the Western population, as well as a few pockets down in uh, coastal Carolinas. What we hope that leads to in terms of more monarchs is when we look at the conservation potential of the CCAA, we have a target of around 300 million stems of milkweed. Um, you know, this is sort of big number, but based on what we can sort of estimate based on the lands that we hope to enroll um, at that full, full scale enrollment, um, 
and we hope to produce 300 million tons of milkweed on these grounds. And you know, if you do the simple math on that, you know, there's estimates out there, right, that about 28 and a half stems of milkweed equal equate to one over overwintering monarch, at least for the for the eastern population. Um, then that could lead essentially to just over 10 million monarchs annually, just resulting from an agreement like this. Um, so that's a, a sizable increase, and um, you know, we hope that an agreement like this can generate those types of benefits for the population overall. Go to the next slide. So to that end, um, especially with the recent approval of the agreement, and knowing also that there's the listing decision coming up um, in December of this year, we've established an early enrollment target. So we're trying to uh, early on get a lot of partners enrolled, signed up, and in the door so they can start implementing these conservation commitments uh, right now. Um, that information can also be uh, considered as um, the Fish and Wildlife Service is looking um, and considering that listing decision. And so we've, we've asked ourselves, sort of, what can what, what can be a meaningful contribution to the uh, you know the target set for monarchs as a result of this agreement? And so we've targeted for the first two months of enrollment. Our hope is that we can get enough partners signed on to generate uh, roughly about 465,000 adopted acres, so actual acres where conservation is happening on these energy and transportation lands. Um, so you might be asking, well, why, why that amount? Um, that, that really comes out of the, again, the Fog, Fog Barton paper, the All Hands on Deck paper, um, that identified some of the conservation needs across different land use sectors to achieve that 1.3 billion milkweed stem target. And for the rights of waste sector specifically, there was a goal of about 232 million stems as sort of a, a target for that sector. And so when we looked at that goal, what it takes for us to get to that based on the adopted acres and the expected benefit, um, you know, we think 465,000 equates roughly to about 30% of that goal. And so essentially if we can get, we can achieve 30% of that goal in terms of getting commitments up front um, as a result of the agreement, we think that that's a, a meaningful early contribution um, that we can get that much industry support and involvement um, essentially, you know, right out of the gate with an agreement like this. So we're actively working and um, talking with a number of, uh, you know, the number of organizations from the energy sector and transportation sector about applying and enrolling so we can hopefully meet that target here uh, towards the end of May. Go to the next slide. Right. So in that bigger picture context of uh, that collaborative conservation, um, as Tim mentioned, this is really critical, especially um, you know, given the funding limitations for threatened endangered species. Promoting voluntary conservation is, you know, really how to get ahead of, um, you know, species conservation, preventing those losses. And there's been a lot of recognition that rights of ways are a great opportunity uh, to implement that approach. Uh, you know, rights of ways generally are maintain as early successional habitat or at least they could be if they're managed you know in a manner that allows for that and given their their sort of linear nature they often also act as connection corridors they have the potential to be connection corridors across habitats that might not otherwise be connected and so those values you know trying to encourage that and think about the role of rights of ways at a landscape level in conservation needs such as this is really important so when we look at what we're trying to do at the CCAA, we're really trying to make conservation actions, like conservation measures for monarchs, essentially part of quote, what they do. Uh, in the same way that um, you know, any large entity needs to consider you know, waterway protections or um, you know, invasive species management or things like that, um, we hope that monarch conservation becomes a part of the program and it becomes a consideration so it can be planned and incorporated um, into everything that they do, not just you know a, a project here, a project there, but into just the overall operation. Uh, we really would consider that a success. And last, the CCA itself gives a platform for industry to have those conversations and to collaborate and share knowledge, share information, 
to continually improve what they're doing and uh, become more effective in their conservation. That's really fundamentally what the Rights of Ways Habitat and Working Group uh, you know, started doing, and we really see the CCAA as a great mechanism to continue to promote that kind of cooperation. Next slide. Great, so um, also at a high level, so you know, we have that potential to improve milkweed nectar plants broadly across a large scale, millions of acres. Um, as Iris alluded to, the, uh, you know, the fact that this is the first ever conservation conservation agreement at such a large scale also presents sort of um, a new frontier in terms of trying to get that much collaboration at a national scale. And because of that, we really hope that this will provide an example for similar efforts to do conservation for monarchs as well as other species. Next slide. Great. So I want to talk a little bit now about how the CCAA works on the ground. Um, starting from the right side, and Iris, if you can help me with some of the progressions here. Um, you know, as we've been talking about, there's conservation measures that uh, that partners will be um, implementing. These are, you know, vegetation management measures, things like brush removal, conservation mowing, you know, using uh, spot treatments of herbicide, things like that, and also what we call idle land, essentially just Setting aside areas that they're not disturbing in any given year and allowing them to beat habitat undisturbed um, to support monarchs. So they'll do that on a certain proportion of their, of their system. Um, in areas where they have to do maintenance work or construction work where there is some type of disturbance, we're promoting using things like native seed mixes to um, you know, either enhance or restore native vegetation where it might not currently be. And then as a result of that, um, which say that that sort of constitutes what happens on what we're calling adopted acres. That's where partners are adopting conservation measures. Then on the remaining portion of the enrolled land, the partner then um, continues to do their operations and maintenance much like they normally do. Um, this is where those regulatory assurances come in handy that they can continue to do what they need to do for safety, for reliability, um, to continue to operate those energy and transportation uses. And so those might be in natural areas, those might be in agricultural lands, um, residential areas. Um, these rights of ways really cross a myriad of different landscapes. And so, again, providing that flexibility is going to be key uh, for that motivating enrollment and cooperation and participation in the agreement. Next slide. So on those adopted acres, which we keep referring to conservation measures, uh, this is essentially what we're talking about. These should be familiar probably to, to most of you, but uh, you know, doing actions like adjusting their, their timing for mowing to periods when monarchs aren't present. Um, so following you know, the joint ventures, uh, you know, mowing, conservation mowing time frame guidance. Um, using things like targeted herbicide treatments to, you know, minimize any you know damage to, to flowering plants or to milkweeds and uh, allowing for a great abundant source of nectar plants being available. Uh, similarly, that's a symbol of symbol with uh, native seeds and plants and, and again, getting those in the landscape where uh, disturbance is occurring. Uh, doing things like brush removal, forestry mowing to remove woody vegetation. That's often a part of uh, much of right-of-way maintenance already. And using the CCA, CCAA in a way that promotes that so that um, you know, we can continue to promote grassland habitat and open habitat along with these other measures uh, to, again, maximize the amount of flowering diversity we can get on these sites. And last is that suitable habitat set aside I, I referenced, where uh, just by virtue of being a right-of-way, by having the infrastructure in place, uh, we can have areas of undisturbed habitat out there um, year after year. Next slide. So how much of this are partners committing to doing? Uh, that really varies across the type of land use that is occurring here. And so across the um, industries involved, you know, the energy sector, the transportation sector, there are differing what we call adoption rates across each different portion of that. Those range on the low end um, within 
both oil, gas, and electric distribution at a, a 1% of the land that they're enrolling that they have to commit to doing conservation measures. Distribution lines are typically the lines that are, um, you know, feeding into your homes, your businesses. You know, these are smaller, typically in more developed areas. So there's just not typically a lot of land available to do conservation on. That's why it's a, a smaller level, 1%. On the opposite end, we have things like transmission. So these are, are larger pipelines, larger electric lines that have larger rights of ways. They typically are going cross country and um, you know, have more land opportunity available to do conservation work and to do the types of practices that will help promote monarchs on those areas. And so these rates were developed um, in part by some of the suggested rates that were included in Again, the all hands on deck paper. We also went through and um, interviewed a number of industry partners as to what was feasible on their land, and that's where we, we have these, these resulting rates. And I should note that these are minimum rates, so we are encouraging partners as they're enrolling. If they can do more conservation than just this minimum, by all means, um, we're trying to do that and help incentivize that as they're enrolling. Next slide. All right, so Iris, I'll turn it back over to you, and um, you can let people know um, where we go from here. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so um, again, recognizing all of you are probably um, already doing maybe active work with energy companies or um, departments of transportation or other DOTs. Um, I think it's, it's important to be aware of the CCAA, um, to have tools that maybe you can um, integrate into some conversations that you may already be having with some of those partners. So I wanted to make you aware um, that we do have um, additional information on our website. Um, so the Rights Away is Habitat Working Group, um, you can Google that. Um, and then there's a dedicated page on the Working Group's website um, for the National Monarch CCAA. Um, so we have just basic information there um, and then for those who create user accounts, um, you can also access you know, the more detailed um, you know, information, the application forms, those sorts of things. So I really encourage you um, to start this conversation um, if you aren't already um, with your utilities and DOTs um, that you're already working with. I think it's also um, important to think about ways that you can potentially support, um, again, the utilities and DOTs, um, helping them identify uh, potential areas for habitat projects. Um, again, thinking about these rights of way as areas that can connect um, favorable landscapes, as, as Dan pointed out. Um, I think you know there's certainly a lot of land out there um, to choose from, and so finding the areas that are going to have um, a high impact or um, a priority impact, I think, um, can be very helpful. Um, there are always ongoing concerns around. The, the management and maintenance of, of these areas over time. Um, certainly utilities and DOTs have elaborate management plans, um, and that is part of, again, their, um, their implementation of the CCAA. But I think trying to find those collaborative types of um, supportive partnerships that can assist with management and maintenance activities, um, particularly maybe where there's areas where they're trying you know, a new type of, of uh, vegetation management or working with a new type of seed mix, um, it's helpful to use the expertise that you all have um, working in the conservation field um, to support them um, as they try these new activities as well. And then always looking for ways to help monitor, um, track the effectiveness of these areas. Um, I think there's collaborative opportunities there as well um, to support utilities and DOTs um, as they're monitoring the, the success um, of these projects over time. And then certainly not to be um, you know, un undervalued is the importance of celebrating the work that utilities and DOTs um, do. Um, again, I think when we speak particularly to, to DOTs and, and utilities, particularly the vegetation management folks, they're used to getting a lot of complaints. And so I think finding opportunities um, to really um, celebrate and acknowledge um, these types of activities that are having a positive benefit um, and really help to kind of sh shift the conversation and change some of the expectations and perceptions 
around what should a right of way look like. Um, you know, there's still through parts of the country um, an expectation that rights of way will look very um, moan and tidy. And so through activities like the CCAA, we're really trying to shift towards a more natural native type landscape. Um, and finding ways to, again, um, celebrate those moves um, and those decisions by utilities and DOTs um, is a really helpful way um, to acknowledge the work um, that they're doing. So those are just um, a number of, of suggestions. Um, also, to the extent that um, you want to get more information about the CCAA, uh, potentially have um, more detailed conversations, um, encourage you to reach out to us. We'll provide our contact information here shortly. Um, but also want to direct you um, on that same Monarch CCAA page. Um, we have a link to a variety of different webinars that we've given um, over the course of the last several years. Um, many of them go into much more detail um, on the mechanics of the CCAA, um, how to apply. Um, we have a variety of different case studies from some of our partner organizations terms of how they're implementing the CCAA or hope to implement the CCAA on their lands. Um, so there's a lot of good information out there, again, that's recorded as webinars. And then also on the Fish and Wildlife Services website, they have um, also some really good resources, a general FAQ document, um, as well as other information and the, and the final CCAA documents and, and related materials as well. So um, on both of those websites, um, you can find um, additional information. So as promised, um, here is our contact information. Um, myself, again, at University of Illinois Chicago. Um, we didn't mention explicitly, I don't think, but UIC will be serving as the program administrator of this agreement, which essentially means uh, we will hold the overarching permit and utilities and DOTs and railroads um, will apply for coverage under that larger permit. Um, so over the course of the life of the agreement, um, again, we'll be in that administrative oversight and coordination role. Um, and then Dan at Cardno um, has really, really led the, the technical development of the CCAA. Um, and Tim at Environmental Policy Innovation Center um, has been a key resource throughout the process um, in terms of helping us think bigger picture um, on some of the, the policy implications and opportunities. So with that, um, I know there have been some questions coming in, and we're happy to, to help answer questions that you might have. Yeah, thanks, Iris, Dan, and Tim. Um, just a reminder to everybody, feel free to, this is your opportunity to ask questions of them about the CCAA and anything related to it. So um, please, please let us know if you have questions using the send question to staff feature of the chat box. Um, so, to the three of you, I'll let you um, decide, but there have been a couple questions on, um, I'm going to kind of merge a few questions into one, but there have been a few questions coming from the conservation community, obviously, obviously around ecology and botany and um, the definition of native. So, could you talk a little bit about how you address, like, native and local ecotype and how these kinds of practices might um, affect biological aspects of, you know, mowing for invasive species might also kill milkweed and um, the timing of monarchs, you know, in their breeding cycle might be impacted by some of these management practices. So could you talk a little bit about how the CCAA addresses or defines those things? Sure, this is Dan. Um, there's a lot there, so <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, as far as, I mean, I'll say broadly, the CCAA, you know, we kept some of those aspects fairly broad and open-ended, just because uh, we know how those are managed across the country um, can vary quite a bit. Um, you know, take like native seed, for example. Um, I know some locations, some regions, they're, they're very concerned about local ecotypes, and so uh, there might be some really strict limitations or recommendations on, you know, um, where you're getting that seed from. Um, in other parts of the country, it might be harder to to find enough native seed vendors to, to provide, you know, within a, a short, uh, you know, physical distance from a location. So 
we didn't want to sort of artificially constrain or uh, prohibit people from enrolling because they couldn't meet some of those um, requirements that one region might have that another might not. So we really kept those uh, definitions broad and open-ended um, for people to implement sort of according to their region. So similar for uh, like things like just what is native versus what is invasive, we, we didn't get into really uh, defining that as much other than you know sort of what's ecologically appropriate for the region that they're in. Um, and then as far as the question about management practices and how those might impact monarchs, um, that's right, you know, things like mowing, um, you know, we're trying to promote things like conservation mowing, which would occur, you know, again, typically at times when monarchs are not present, unless they're doing that sort of midsummer mowing for, for some portions of the country. Um, and then, you know, but I think the thing to keep in mind with this is that currently a lot of these practices are happening, a lot of management practices are happening um, regardless of whether or not monarchs are present or not. And so the fact that we can affect change on, you know, in some cases, a substantial portion of those lands um, to avoid impacts to monarchs and to promote habitat at the same time, um, actually, that's where we expect that net benefit to come from, uh, both not just in improving milkweed and nectar plants, but also you know, by um, avoiding disturbance to monarchs on a significant portion of that as well. Yeah, thank you. That was that was helpful. Um, and and also sort of as a quick follow up to that, I, I think you may have touched on this, but is there um, does the CCAA provide any type of guidance on what species to plant or where to get plants or anything like that, or is that primarily the responsibility of the participating entity? Um, yes, we don't have this like a list of um, you know, native seed vendors or um, specifications for what that should be. Again, we, we, we tried to keep that fairly open-ended in large part because we quickly realized early on in the process that um, you know, how people put some of these things into practice can vary quite a bit from, from coast to coast. And so, um, again, to promote as much participation as we could, we didn't want to um, constrain anybody. So, so yes, yeah, so they'd have to go to you know, some of their regional, regional guidance um, and guidelines there. We do, um, within the section that we talk about conservation measures, make recommendations you know, to some of the other reference material that's available and guidance that's out there. And maybe I'll just add to um, that through the Rights Away as Habitat Working Group, um, just last year, um, having gotten the question from a lot of DOTs and utility companies about you know where they could easily get um, you know, native seed kind of at scale, right, um, in large quantities that they might need for um, some of their larger restoration projects or seeding projects, um, we did start a, um, a native seed map. Um, on the working group's website um, and have been um, trying to gather information about um, seed vendors or, or native seed experts um, that are willing to work with, again, some of these large-scale um, land managers like utilities or, or DOTs. Um, so if you are or know someone um, who is interested in those types of projects, um, please contact us and we can make sure that your information gets captured on that seed map. Awesome. Um, there's a question on enrollment of lands. So are the adoption rates um, the percent of land in each category or the percent of their eligible land that they pledge to enroll or something else? So the, <clears throat> see if I understand the question correctly. So the, Adoption rates are the percentage of the enrolled lands. So, um, you know, many of the, the organizations that are looking at enrolling are looking at enrolling their, their entire system. Um, again, in part because of those regulatory assurances, um, they'd like to have that sort of consistently across their system. So, um, in many cases, that could be, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of acres. Um, and so, what the adoption rate is, is the portion that they're enrolling that gets the conservation commitments 
and conservation measures applied to on an annual basis. Um, have you considered expanding this effort in the future to cover other at-risk species or other pollinators like bumblebees? That's a great question. Um, yes. So um, early on in the process, uh, we had um, that conversation with the Fish and Wildlife Service. I think there's definitely recognition across the partners that we're working with in the utility sector and transportation sector <clears throat> that, excuse me, um, these conservation measures these lands um, certainly provide benefit to many other species besides just the monarchs. But I think for the, the sake of working through, again, the first national CCAA, so an agreement of this scale, um, and trying to, again, I mean, to some extent, it was a bit of a thought experiment um, with the Fish and Wildlife Service to make sure that, again, we could develop an agreement like this. Um, and so we made the very strategic decision to just focus on the monarch butterfly initially. Um, but I think there is a lot of interest and certainly opportunity um, to consider expanding it to integrate or bring in other at-risk species as well. Um, so that's definitely a conversation that um, we have started with the Fish and Wildlife Service and some of our partners um, and hope to continue. Awesome. Um, a couple of questions about funding and fees. Um, so, so just broadly, is there a financial cost or fee for enrollment in the CCAA? And um, one, just a little bit more explicitly, given this year's likely revised and skinnier budget, what can state departments anticipate about administrative fees? Does this depend on the amount of acreage they apply to include? Yep. Um, so there are um, administrative fees associated um, with participation. So um, again, given that this is a programmatic agreement um, where the University of Illinois Chicago um, serves as that kind of central program administrator, um, we do have an annual fee um, that essentially just covers that administration and coordination um, cost on our end. Um, the fee um, is ranges between $5,000 and $30,000 a year, um, but average, what we're finding um, for most partners is it's right around $15,000 is, is typically um, the cost. Um, and to answer the other question, um, what, why it varies from partner to partner is because it is dependent on um, the, the amount of land that they're enrolling, and even more specifically, um, the number of acres that they're required to do conservation work on. Um, and so that adopted acres value is, is kind of the primary factor um, that determines um, the annual administrative fee. That said, um, there's a number of um, additional um, kind of beneficial discounts and incentives that we've built into the administrative fee. Um, the organizations that go above and beyond um, their, their annual um, adopted acres rate um, can receive a reduced annual administrative fee. Um, if you implement additional supplemental measures, like if you're doing additional monitoring activities, um, then you can also qualify for um, a lower administrative fee. And then also to help incentivize that early enrollment, like Dan talked about, um, we are offering some discounts to organizations that enroll before the end of May. Um, so if you enroll before the end of May, um, you'd get a 10% discount on your administrative fee for the first three years. Um, so hopefully that uh, will sweeten the deal for some organizations um, that, again, are, are trying to decide enroll now or, or wait and see. Um, and so we're, we're hoping, again, to, to get a lot of participation here at the beginning. Yeah, everybody likes a good discount. Um, <laughs> that's <Yeah>. great. <laughs> Um, there is a, a, a quick question on um, our water transfer rights of way also considered as potential habitat for the CCA. Dan, do you want to help me answer that one? Sure, sure. So water transfer rights of way. So, um, as I recall, it's not uh, a sector that's included, um, unless there's a, there's a direct tie to 
energy or transportation land use. Um, if it's just you know water for like water supply, that would not be a sector that's included in the CCA at this time. Okay. We've had a lot of discussion um, on this one. So, I'll, yeah, I, I would say if, if you're a water utility um, and you're interested, I'd still suggest you reach out to us. Cool. Um, I'm going to rephrase this question to be a little bit more broadly, but how, how – um, how have you approached different entities for participation? Like, are you are you going out and seeking participation from them, or um, you know, kind of how are you marketing this program to different entities, and or how can the conservation community help you in that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, a lot of our interest um, and potential participation has come from organizations that are involved in that rights of way as habitat working group um, so they have a pretty uh, decently sized network um, through that working group already um, but certainly the ccaa kind of in and of itself has attracted um, a lot of additional interest um, so we've been receiving um, i would say over the last um, particularly year and a half um, dan and i in particular have been um, really on kind of a speaking circuit at conferences um, so we've been at a lot of industry conferences, um, both in person and webinars, um, to help just get the word out, um, to help organizations kind of understand that this opportunity is available um, and kind of how it works and, and how it can be integrated into their, into, into their programs. And then the second part of that, again, how can the conservation community help? Um, again, I think I would say to the extent that you have existing relationships um, with your local utilities or departments of transportation, um, that's a great way, again, to start the conversation. Um, I think one of the, the first questions we oftentimes get from utilities and DOTs is how much work is this going to be? You know, how um, am I going to have to do a lot of work either up front to apply? Um, what's it going to mean going forward? Um, and so I think having a conversation starter um, and maybe helping to put those folks into touch with our team um, to be able to share more information and even connect them to other partners in the industry um, that are doing this work um, could be helpful. Yeah, so as a quick follow-up to that, is there a, a go-to place that you could recommend where people might be able to find the specific list of entities who are um, involved already so if they're trying to approach their local organizations that they're working with or or might want to approach a new one how would they go about finding out whether or not they've already been engaged yeah that's a great question so we have um, on the the rights away working groups website again we have a monarch ccaa web page um, and on that main page we have um, identification of all the, the utilities and DOTs that have been collaborators on the CCIA. Um, so those would be kind of like the short list of folks who have been really intimately involved in the development of the CCIA. Um, we have a number of others who weren't on that advisory team or you know, maybe integrally involved in the development, um, but we may be in communications with. Um, but I, I don't. I think in that scenario, it's probably it doesn't hurt um, to reach out um, to those organizations again, since um, many of them haven't made formal commitments. Um, but in general, another source would be um, on the Rightsway Working Group page under About um, Us or About the Working Group. We also have a list of organizations that are involved in the Working Group more broadly. Um, so that would be another um, way to again kind of double check um, who it is that that you're um, in contact with. Um, and certainly, again, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly um, if you have questions about whether a particular company or agency um, has been in contact with us. Awesome. Um, how are you planning to enforce what entities have committed to? Are there audits required or is it just self-reporting? So uh, each organization that's a partner to the agreement um, has to submit an annual report um, that is self-reported, um, but we will be reviewing the information um, and, again, confirming that the agreement as a whole um, is meeting the, the overall conservation benefit 
as well as the individual um, partners, so the utilities and the DOTs, are meeting um, each of the, the required um, aspects of the, the CCAA. Um, so there is a process. Um, if an organization is non-compliant, um, they can be removed from the agreement. Um, we don't expect that to be um, a situation that happens very often, um, but there is a process for that. Um, separately, there's an adaptive management process um, that allows us to um, evaluate the, the quality of the habitat that we're seeing, so essentially the effectiveness of the conservation measures, um, and look to see or confirm that hopefully we're having the conservation benefits that we anticipate. Um, and if not, then um, conversations that we'll have with the Fish and Wildlife Service and our partners um, to see how we can adjust um, practices or monitoring um, to get a better handle on maybe why activities haven't been effective and, and what improvements we could make. Great. Um, what the, there's a question on what's the expectation if monarchs aren't listed? Um, what happens to entities that have already signed on? Could they walk away? Um, have there been formal or informal commitments to follow the guidelines regardless of the listing decision? So we ask um, partners that are enrolling, um, there's kind of a, a soft uh, recommendation that they commit to um, participate in the agreement for five years. Um, although this is a voluntary agreement, so an organization can choose to leave um, at any point. Um, so again, there is a process to commit for multiple years. Um, and I think if we find ourselves in a situation where say the monarch is not listed, um, hopefully, again, the organizations that have enrolled at that point um, will continue to through, you know, with the conservation commitments that they've made um, and certainly kind of see, um, you know, their continued role in um, helping the monarch butterfly. Um, that's another argument to be made, I think, for potentially integrating other species into the future. So I think if this were to become a multi-species agreement, um, probably provides even more value to the organizations um, to participate, um, regardless of an individual listing decision. Um, good, and, and kind of as a follow-up to the, the listing process, um, this is more of a comment than a question, but, but you guys can elaborate to um, make sure to mention how this interacts with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Monarch Conservation Database and the deadline for this coming May for how 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 does enrollment in the CCAA impact the listing decision? Right. Um, yeah. So our our early enrollment deadline um, and that that goal um, target that Dan mentioned for 465 um, thousand um, adopted acres or habitat acres. Um, you know, that's very much in line with um, wanting to be able to capture those commitments in the Monarch Conservation Database. Um, so ensuring that, um, again, they can be included as part of the services um, piece analysis and part of their listing decision. Um, and so that, again, is, is one effort that we have um, with our partners is to make sure um, that their commitments are captured. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, so I have one more question unless any more sneak in. In regard to, um, through this process, have you done any sorts of business analyses to see if this impacts regulated utilities or changes to the rate base? Uh, this is Dan. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't done any analysis to see if it would change the rate base. Um, if I could say broadly, we wouldn't expect there to be any impact there. Um, again, essentially a lot of the conservation measures we're expecting to be folded into sort of the routine vegetation management that would be occurring already for a lot of utilities. It's just shifting how and where they apply certain things. And so to that end, uh, we wouldn't see it really being um, the any substantial or even any cost impact to a lot of utilities. So most utilities that have been involved see the implementation really being just folded into kind of their current operation. Yeah, and to that point, 
I'll just add that, um, again, it, it is dependent, you know, from organization to organization, but I think increasingly organizations that are adopting these integrated vegetation management practices, um, you know, looking at alternate mowing cycles or um, moving towards targeted herbicides as opposed to broadcast herbicides, um, really start to see some significant cost savings over time. Um, so again, managing rights of way, I think in this way, where you're really promoting these early successional um, plants that again can provide habitat benefits, um, over time can result in, in reduced mowing requirements um, or management requirements in general, um, which also then leads to cost savings um, and now regulatory certainty with this agreement, um, it really does um, demonstrate a, a, a triple win, so to speak, uh, for wildlife, for um, the conservation community, um, for you know companies from a, a management and cost standpoint as well. Um, so there's a lot of benefits here. Yeah, um, so as we give people just a few more minutes to um, think of or ask questions, do you, do you all have any kind of concluding thoughts or anything else you want to make sure to talk about just in terms of as this thing starts to ramp up and, and people get enrolled in it? What, um, I don't know, just any any closing thoughts that you might have as, as we give people an opportunity to ask final questions. Yeah, um, Tim, do you want to start maybe? Yeah, I would just add that, um, you know, this is a really exceptional agreement. It's the biggest one of its kind done in the last roughly 20 years um, in a sort of category of similar agreements, candidate conservation agreements and safe harbor agreements. Um, it has a number of, uh, of attributes about it that should make it, you know, relatively easy to implement. And one of the most exciting things about the companies and the agencies that are participating in this um, program, or I think are likely to participate in it, um, are that they already have a lot of personal and professional and business motivations to do this kind of work. Um, and so I really think this is sort of an organizing vehicle to, to, get, uh, to get even more activity together to, to deal with the sort of the ESA issue broadly, but, but really to just to focus a lot of attention and goodwill on effective monarch conservation. And I often think about um, programs like this as being iterative um, so, and, and reflecting on some of the questions that we got. Whereas, you know, the first year or the second year of what uh, a participant may do um, is, you know, version 1.0 or 1.5. Um, there's a chance for the conservation, for the monitoring, um, and for the understanding of outcomes to get just better and better over time. Um, and having a partner like like uh, Iris's group, um, ERC, as a, as a steward over this is also pretty unique. There's not another university in a role like this for one of these agreements across the country. It's a great example of, the, uh, of a university serving its public mission. And um, so I'm just really excited to see you know, what happens uh, once uh, enrollments start coming in and you start seeing, seeing conservation you know, go in on the ground and, and be tracked. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Dan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah. I mean, first off, thank you for having us today. I've been really enjoying the fact we can share this and uh, appreciate all the questions and interest in, in the CCAA overall. Um, it's really encouraging. And, uh, you know, building on what Tim was saying, I think one thing that's really been encouraging for me is seeing how much change the CCAA has, has already had, even, even prior to being approved and finalized. Um, the motivating factor of it for a number of organizations to promote better practices and to have important conversations and to motivate change in preparation for enrollment has has really been amazing and really wonderful to see uh, and been really really encouraged by that and so you know to Tim's point about being iterative I do see this as being something that will continue to develop and grow and as Iris mentioned you know we potentially include other species. So as big and wonderful as this is, I, I think we're all hopeful that this is really uh, just an important first step on a road to uh, incorporating other pollinators and other conservation benefits in the years to come. Thanks, Dan. And both Tim and Dan did a nice job of um, kind of echoing, I think, similar 
feelings that I have. Um, again, UIC, the University of Illinois Chicago, um, is really excited to be um, kind of at the center of, of leading this um, agreement and, and continuing to do the work that we're doing with utilities and um, departments of transportation and railroads. And again, I think looking at the work that's been happening um, and using the CCAA as a way to continue to motivate that and recognize and support um, the organizations that have been doing this proactive work and then even kind of encourage it a little bit more from some of the folks who've been watching on the sidelines, um, I think is really exciting. And it's, as I said before, really helping to change the conversation around the role that rights of way play. You know, again, many of us tend to think of rights of way as these kind of scars across the landscape, um, but there's a tremendous opportunity for it to be the opposite, you know, to be these connectors. Um, and so I hope through this agreement, um, through you know all of your support, through the work um, with energy and transportation organizations, um, we can see some really big conservation benefits on these types of lands. Yeah, thank you, Iris, Tim, and Dan. I think it's a huge testament to to you all and and the teams that you've engaged in building this. It's a really tremendous um, accomplishment, and so I think. I think the conservation community is grateful to everything that you've put into it and and like you said look forward to the results of of the ccaa growing and engaging this sector and um, these sectors and in, in voluntary conservation so um with that i think we will close out i think we have recorded the webinar today so so iris will we'll we'll work it out on the back end to make sure the recording gets back out to um, be available for viewing later. So thanks to everyone that participated and we will be in touch soon. Great, and thank you, Wendy, for hosting us today.